And here we go. Welcome to the third and final virtual meeting on the Built Forum Rezoning Study. Uh, my name is Paul Mogish, and I'm joined today by Jason Wittenberg, Janelle Widmeyer, and Jim Bull. Behind the scenes, we have Sarah McKenzie and John Lewis keeping things running for this virtual meeting. After two successful meetings on this topic in September, we had two false starts this, this month uh, for the third meeting. If you tried to join us for one of those, uh, we sincerely apologize for the technical difficulties we experienced. Today's meeting is intended to focus on proposed built form regulations for the downtown area. Our goal today is to present for approximately 30 minutes and then leave 30 minutes for questions. At any time during the presentation, if you have a question, you can type it into the question feature here in Microsoft Teams. If you're joining us by phone, you can submit questions after the meeting via the Minneapolis2040.com website. After the 30 minutes of presentation, we will answer as many of the questions as we can. If we can't get to all of them in the time allotted, we will post both the questions and the staff answers on the Minneapolis2040.com website. And I should say too that for, for the question and answer period, Today, uh, we will prioritize any questions that are specifically about downtown, uh, and then if we if we have time after that, we can get to questions that apply to the rest of the city. Uh, next slide, please. Just as you have questions for us, we have some questions for you. Now, our job as staff is to propose built form regulations that that will be considered by the city planning commission and the city council. We have three questions for you that will help us do that. So as you listen to the presentation today, we encourage you to think about these. Uh, the first is, what suggestions do you have for improving the proposed rules in order to more effectively implement the built form policies of Minneapolis 2040? The second is, what else should be considered in these draft built form regulations to further the goals and policies of Minneapolis 2040? And then finally, we'll have a section in the, pre in the presentation about premiums. And so the question is, are these the right premiums uh, to further achieve 2040 goals? Or do you have other ideas? We'll pick these questions up again at the end of the presentation. Um, and if all of this seems confusing, no worries. Zoning regulations are really complex. They're not always user friendly, but we're going to do our best during this meeting um, to make it clear how to go about reading these proposals on your own time so that you can be informed and ask questions and offer comment. With that, I'll turn it over to Joe Bernard to get things started with a brief overview of Minneapolis 2040. Thank you, Paul. Um, before, as uh, Paul mentioned, before we get into the built form content uh, in the zoning code itself that we've been working on updating, we want to make sure that everyone is grounded in a common understanding of why these changes are happening. Uh, so these zoning code changes are rooted in policies that are found in Minneapolis 2040, the city's comprehensive plan adopted in 2019 and in effect since January of this year it contains policies and actions that the city will take to support six values and achieve 13 adopted goals. Completing a comprehensive plan is required uh, by state law and the process is undertaken by cities every 10 years. The planning process for Minneapolis 2040 took upwards of four years, including over 150 public meetings and over 20,000 points of contact with stakeholders. Next slide, please. Among the goals adopted in the plan are that by 2040, the city would, will eliminate disparities, increase access to housing and jobs, increase affordable housing, support complete communities and address climate change. Next slide. Chief among the policy directions in Minneapolis 2040 is the guidance that governs development of property. This is shown through a series of policy statements and through two maps that show first the uses that are allowed on a given property. So commercial, residential, etc. We refer to this as land use. And second, the size of buildings that are allowed on a given property, height, bulk, 
et cetera. We call this built form. Next slide. Implementing the built form elements of Minneapolis 2040 is the current focus of our zoning work. These regulations include the height and scale of buildings allowed in each built form district found on that map in Minneapolis 2040. Our process will not include re-examining or changing the Minneapolis 2040 maps or making policy changes to Minneapolis 2040. This process also does not include changes to where commercial uses are allowed or required. That work will come in 2021-2022. Next slide. These changes to our zoning ordinance ordinances will bring consistency between our zoning regulations and the policies and maps found in Minneapolis 2040. Consistency between plans and zoning is something that is required of us by state law. Next slide. We started working on this process last year and two zoning code changes took effect in January 1st of this year. One was a change that allowed three residential units on every property in the city that allows residential uses. uses <clears throat> excuse me. So there's no longer zoning districts in the city that are exclusively zoned for single family use. The second change is in inclusionary zoning regulation. What that means is that new apartment and condominium buildings are required to provide a certain percentage of their units uh, as affordable. Next slide. These standards are critical components of implementing uh, the goals of the city's comprehensive plan, including eliminating racial disparities, combating greenhouse gas emissions, and increasing access to jobs and housing. Minneapolis 2040 is much more detailed than previous citywide plans. It clearly spells out the land use and built form categories for every property in the city. Part of the reason for that is to create more predictable outcomes for all interested parties during the development process. In the past, there wasn't always clear policy guidance regarding, regarding things like how tall buildings should be in different parts of the city. Also, it's been fairly common for developers to submit variances to allow flexibility from certain standards like setbacks and allowed floor area. Our intent is that these new regulations will be applied more rigidly with far fewer variances requested or granted. Next slide. All of the information needed to review proposed changes to the zoning code can be found at Minneapolis2040.com. There is a link at the top of the page that will bring you to the built form rezoning, rezoning study content. There you can find background information on Minneapolis 2040, events information, and a tentative timeline for review and adoption of these zoning changes. Most importantly, information about the changes themselves are available in a couple of formats. Uh, at the end of the page, there's also a form that we would encourage you to use to submit feedback to us. We understand there's a lot of detailed content that we're covering and that we have limited time to do so in these meetings, so we will be giving just a high level overview of the proposed regulations and their intent here. Uh, but we certainly encourage everyone to review materials in greater detail on the website. I believe the slideshow and meeting notes with Q&A will be posted online uh, soon as well. Uh, now it's time to get into the actual uh, proposed regulations. I uh, will hand things off to Jason Wittenberg, Janelle Widmeyer, and Jim Vole to give an overview of the changes that are proposed to the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Joe. I'll start with floor area ratio. Uh, floor area ratio governs the overall size of a building allowed on a property. It's a calculation based on the size of the lot. So to arrive at allowed FAR, you take the size of the lot and multiply it by the FAR number. So for example, if you have a property that is, that is subject to a floor area ratio of 1.0, you take the size of the lot and simply multiply that by one, and that's the allowed square footage of buildings on that site. So for illustrative purposes, here are three examples of how a property with an FAR of one could be arranged on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, but an architect who's designing a project has to understand how FAR intersects with other rules. So in a district that's limited to three stories, for example, arranging your FAR in a four-story configuration wouldn't be an option. 
Looking at the table on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, these are the F base FAR numbers proposed in each built form district. In this table, you'll see that each built form district would have separate regulations based on whether they are paired with residential zoning or commercial zoning. Proposed FAR would be slightly higher in uh, commercial zoning districts. So if you look at the row for quarter four, the FAR for residence and office residence zoning would be two, and for all other districts, those commercial, industrial, downtown districts, uh, it would be 2.2. As you go farther down the table, you see that FAR increases a bit as you get to higher intensity built form districts. We're trying to very closely match the allowed FAR with height allowed in each built form district, and we've done uh, a fair amount of data collection for buildings that have been approved and built at different heights in order to inform these rules. Historically, as Joe referenced, a significant percentage of, de of development projects have requested variances to increase allowed FAR, and we hope to substantially reduce such variance requests while still ensuring that we're only allowing buildings that are appropriate to the scale called for in each built form district. And currently, we have a few incentives that are authorized to increase FAR above uh, maximum allowed in each in, in certain districts. And FAR premiums are also included in our recommendation as part of this zoning code amendment. In a little while, Janelle will cover uh, FAR premiums and, and how they would apply. And um, with, with somewhat different incentives applying to FAR and height. And we're proposing to expand the number of amenities or public benefits that would earn a bonus, but we'd limit the number of bonuses or, or premiums that would be that could be achieved in most districts. One last thing that I'll note about FAR is that our draft regulations propose to include parking in the calculation of maximum floor area when that parking is enclosed or in a parking structure. A historically enclosed parking simply has been exempt from uh, from floor area calculations. Underground parking, just like other underground spaces, would continue to be exempt. Next slide, please. Uh, the next topic is building height, and height regulations govern the overall height of buildings and structures. In the built form overlay districts, the focus of the height regulations is on principal buildings. This is, or there is specific guidance in the comprehensive plan for height maximums and height minimums in stories. The maximums are what can be built as of right. Other than core 50, the central business district, each district has a maximum height in stories and feet because the height of a story can vary from building to building. There are some exceptions uh, to the table as shown on your screen. Some are less restrictive, some are more restrictive. These are described in more detail on the website. Minimal height requirements are applied where higher intensity buildings are needed to accomplish comprehensive plan goals. Almost all of downtown is subject to a minimum height requirement, and these requirements work together with the FAR regulations to help achieve the goals of the comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. A request can be made to increase uh, maximum height limits. In general, height increases are expected to be more difficult to obtain than they are now. The height increase requirements would depend on location and the type of use. Uh, where the requirements for height increase requests will change the most from the current ordinance will be in the corridor, transit, park, and production built form districts. And these are shown in color on the map. In the comprehensive plan, each district has a description that guides the built form of development that may occur in that district. And specific to the corridor, transit, park, and production districts, the guidance states that requests to exceed the maximum height will be evaluated on the basis of whether or not a taller building is a reasonable means for further achieving comprehensive plan goals. To address this direction from the comprehensive plan, height increases will be subject to three requirements. The first is compliance with a maximum allowed height increase in each district. This means there will be a cap or a limit on height increases. Uh, this cap is intended to help with predictability and maintaining the intent of each district. The maximum allowed increases for the corridor and transit districts align with the maximum height of the next built form district. For example, the maximum allowed height in corridor six is six stories, 84 feet. The maximum height increase in corridor six that could be requested is for four stories, 56 feet, for a total not to exceed 10 stories, 140 feet, uh, which is the maximum allowed height in transit 10. Um, parks and production districts will also have a cap for height increases as well. 
If a height increase request exceeds what is allowed for any district, a rezoning and a comprehensive plan amendment will be required. Both of these applications require a public hearing with the Planning Commission and the City Council. The second requirement is that legal findings must be addressed and legal findings are currently required, but they are proposed to be amended to be better tailored to height increase requests and you can see these online. Uh, the findings allow discretion to be applied as well. And then the third requirement is that a minimum number of premiums need to be provided and this leads to our next topic of incentives. Next slide please. And before I um, begin uh, discussing this topic, just uh, recall that this is um, a topic related to one of the questions mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so we'd like your feedback on whether these are the right premiums to further achieve comprehensive plan goals in development. Uh, so as part of allowing increases to maximum FAR and height, incentives have been drafted. These incentives are referred to as premiums and include requirements for incorporating features into a development project to ensure it goes even further toward achieving policy goals. Each request for floor area ratio or a height increase would need to provide one or more premiums depending on the size of the increase. In addition, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition to being tied to one or more goals of the comprehensive plan, each premium exceeds minimum ordinance requirements. The height increase premiums in particular have been drafted to be above and beyond what is typically seen in developments. Each premium is also intended to benefit the surrounding community in some way, um, but they are not intended to be discretionary. So specific standards for each incentive must be met to qualify for the premium. And you can view these uh, standards in more detail online. Um, premium standards are also drafted to ensure they are practical to achieve but still result in a community benefit. Next slide, please. Uh, the FAR premiums have also been drafted in a way that acknowledge differences between development that can occur in highest intensity districts versus other areas of the city. Uh, there's also been some consideration given to surrounding context and where the most intense growth should occur. There is not a limit to the number of premiums the development could qualify for in Transit 30 or Core 50, whereas the other districts would all be subject to a limit. Um, a couple of the premiums in their standards are the same, such as affordable housing and environmental sustainability related to climate change. Um, overall, more incentives for flurry ratio bonuses are available in Transit 30 and Core 50. The additional and premiums include freight loading terminals, historic preservation, public art, skyway connections, through block connections, transit facilities, and urban open space, both indoor and outdoor. Next slide, please. You'll notice similar types of incentives for the FAR and height increase premiums, but uh, similar, similarly titled premiums do not typically have all the same requirements when it comes to FAR versus height premiums. The height increase premiums are generally intended to be a little more difficult to achieve than the FAR premiums. So additional standards or a higher threshold usually apply to the height increase premiums. In other words, if you qualify for an FAR premium, you don't necessarily qualify for the height increase premium. Uh, one example is um, to qualify for the height increase premium um, for a, mix, a mixed use building, a more commercial floor area would need to be provided than is required to qualify for the FAR premium. Next slide, please. Thank you, Janelle. So lot size regulations govern both the minimum and maximum size of lots. The minimum lot sizes are intended to primarily meet two objectives. First, to recognize kind of practical or functional needs to accommodate different types of uses. Second, to reinforce the existing or desired development or built form patterns in different built form districts. Proposed standards would make more use of maximum lot sizes than we have seen historically in Minneapolis. Such standards limit how many properties can be combined together into a single parcel for redevelopment. The main intent there is to limit the scale of new development. Next slide. I won't go through the table line by line. You can see that the minimums and maximums uh, for buildings with four or more units uh, generally um, are consistent across many of the more intensive built form districts. And then there are slightly more flexible maximums again as you go to higher intensity uh, built form districts. 
Next slide. This slide demonstrates the intent of maximum lot sizes. Uh, this photo here or rendering is an example of a new development in Corridor 6 built form district. It's on First Street North. Uh, Minneapolis 2040, uh, 2040 guidance for Corridor 6 indicates that buildings in the Corridor 6 district should reflect a variety of building types on both, both moderate and large sized lots. So we've proposed a one acre maximum when combining lots for redevelopment in this district. Uh, this building, the archive, would comply with that with a lot size of a little over 35,000 square feet, one acre being just a little over 43,000 square feet. So the developer of this project would have had the ability to add uh, almost another 8,000 square feet to the lot before they would have reached the lot size maximum. Next slide. We also would continue to have lot coverage and impervious surface maximums. Lot coverage refers to the area of the lot covered by principal and accessory buildings, so um, homes, apartments, uh, garages, etc. In the lower intensity districts, we are proposing essentially the same uh, regulations that we have now. And then as you can see, as you get to more intensive built form districts, the, those numbers increase to allow a larger percentage of the lot to be covered by buildings. Next slide. Impervious surface. So in addition to buildings, impervious surface limits uh, address uh, driveways, walkways, patios, uh, other types of paved surfaces. And again, you can see that as you get to more intensive built form districts, those numbers increase. I'll note that in the right hand column, you'll see that in commercial districts and industrial districts, we would continue to not have maximum lot coverage or maximum impervious surface standards. Next slide, please. Our next topic is setbacks and setback regulations, also called yard requirements, indicate how far from a property line a building or other improvement is allowed to be built. Setbacks are utilized to separate uses and structures and are another part of regulating urban form. All built form overlay districts will contain setback regulations. Larger setback requirements apply in the residential areas versus non-residential or mixed use areas, which at times do not have a setback requirement. Not all yard requirements are proposed to change from what is currently required. In most non-residential mixed use areas, including almost all of downtown, the setback requirements are not proposed to change significantly what it, from what is currently required. In residential areas, some requirements will remain the same, but some more significant changes are proposed as well. Uh, downtown has some residential zoning in the Loring Park and Elliott Park neighborhoods. Uh, the changes that are proposed for residential areas are generally less restrictive than what is currently required. Uh, the most significant change proposed is what is uh, is in the interior side yard requirements, and this is what's shown on the table on your screen. Unlike current requirements, the proposed setbacks are based on building height and feet instead of stories. Uh, determining setbacks based on height and feet is a more consistent way to apply a setback requirement since the height of story or stories can vary from building to building. The building height ranges used to determine the setback requirements are based on average floor heights for residential projects. I'll use a six story building as an example to compare the current requirements to the proposed requirements. The average height of a six story residential building is about 71 feet. Under the proposed side yard requirements, the minimum setback requirement for an average six story building would be 11 feet. Under the current ordinance, the minimum setback requirement would be 15 feet. Therefore, the average six story building will have a less restrictive side yard requirement. However, if a taller than average six story building is proposed, the minimum side yard requirement will likely be greater. Uh, the largest, also something to note is the largest possible interior side yard requirement would be 20 feet. And there are other yard requirements, including exceptions that can apply, and there's more information online that covers those requirements. And for the next topic, I'll turn it over to Jim. Next slide, please. Thank you. The Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area was established by executive order by Governor Anderson in 1976 to protect natural, cultural, and scenic resources in the Mississippi River Corridor. In response to concerns about the adequacy of the critical area regulations, the state legislature adopted rules that became effective in 2017 to better regulate the critical area. 
The city is required by the Department of Natural Resources to adopt a zoning overlay district maps and a permitting program for the critical area to implement the rules locally. So why are we talking about this in the built form open house? Because the critical area has separate districts, each with height, setback, and bluff setback regulations. But the built form district requirements will also apply to properties in the critical area with the more restrictive of the built form or critical area requirements applying to properties. More information on the critical area regulations can be found on the critical area text amendment webpage. And the maps of the critical area districts are also included on the built form maps on the built form webpage. I will now turn it back to Paul. Thanks, Jim. Uh, before we go through the next steps and the process and timeline, just a reminder that anybody can feel free to type questions into the question feature. If you kind of move your mouse around in Teams, you'll see um, a little question mark. You can click on that, type in a question, and we as the staff on this meeting will be able to see your question. We'd be happy to to answer um, whatever questions you have in the remaining time. There are actually zero questions that people have submitted so far, so please please feel free to do that. Um, so on next steps, um, this is the final public meeting uh, on the draft built form regulations before the City Planning Commission takes a vote next month. The public comment period began on September 3rd and was originally originally planned to go through this past Monday. That has now been extended. The, the comment period has been extended to November 9th, so you still have a few weeks. On that day, November 9th, the City Planning Commission is scheduled to uh, consider these regulations and take a vote. That meeting, of course, it's a, it'll be a virtual meeting, well, that'll include a formal public hearing at which anyone will have the opportunity to speak directly to the commission. Uh, you can call in uh, and speak directly to the commission. Uh, and of course, you can also submit official comments and writing that, that will be seen by the members of the Planning Commission as well. Um, after that, there will be a vote by the City Council. We're expecting that to be on December 18th. Now, just of course, any time prior to that November 9th uh, City Planning Commission meeting, you can continue to submit comments or questions on the Minneapolis2040.com website. So with that, I think we'll, we'll hang out for just a minute and see if anybody submits a question here in this meeting and we'd be happy to address it. Uh, so far, we still don't don't have any, but we'll, we'll wait just a, just a minute and see if anybody submits something. All right, somebody has asked if we can go over the names of the people who have spoken at this meeting. I think I can field that one. Um, my name is Paul Mogish. I've been joined by Jason Wittenberg, Joe Bernard, Janelle Widmeyer, and Jim Vol. We're all planners at the city of Minneapolis. Uh, okay, here's another question. Um, and I will throw this one to Jason. Will neighbors still be alerted when a property near them requests a variance? Yes, good question. Uh, a variance is an item that would require a public hearing and we will continue to both notify neighborhood organizations as well as uh, 
those within 350 feet of the property when a variance is requested. Thanks, Jason. Any other questions before we conclude? All right, well with that, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Once again, please visit the Minneapolis2040.com website to take a look at the proposed regulations on your own time and feel free to submit comments and questions um, on the website. Have a great day, everybody.